I'd like to call this meeting of the Sterling Heights City Council to order. Please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the invocation. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear God, please bless our elected officials. Grant them courage and wisdom to do what is right for all citizens. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you, Ms. Riska. Can we please have the roll call? Mayor Taylor? Here. Mrs. Saraski? Mrs. Kasky? Present. Mr. Radke? Here. Mrs. Schmidt? Present. Mr. Yanez? Here. Mrs. Yargo? Present. Thank you. Uh, quick announcement that uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sarowski contacted me last week and said she's not able to be here today because she's on a uh, work assignment, work training that was not avoidable. So uh, she uh, apologized for not being able to make it, but has to because of her job. So she'll be back at the next city council meeting. Council, we need approval of the agenda tonight. Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Koski. Move to approve the agenda. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? No discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on our agenda tonight is a report from our city manager, Mark Vanderpool. Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, let me begin by just a reminder of the holiday schedule coming up. In observance of Labor Day, city offices will be closed on Monday, September 7th, and will reopen on the 8th. Uh, so this will also cause a delay in refuse collection. So obviously there'll be no collection on Monday the 7th and uh, it will be delayed then each day through the week. And then Fridays will occur on Saturday. Uh, so if you have any questions about the refuse schedule, feel free to visit our website or you can call Public Works at 446-2440. I wanted to give a quick update on the census too. As everyone knows, we're winding down on the census. There's only four weeks to uh, complete it for those who have not. Uh, thankfully, in Sterling Heights, we're doing very well. Uh, we have a very high percentage rate, one of the highest in the country uh, in our population category, and we're almost at 84%. We have beat our participation rate in 2010 at this time. Uh, so we expect that we'll end up somewhere in the high 80s, but we want to once again encourage anyone who has not completed their census to please do so uh, in the next, uh, certainly in the next four weeks or as soon as possible. We want to make sure that everyone in the city is counted. It's so important uh, for revenue sharing purposes and helping to fund the many projects uh, that we're involved in uh, with the city. And, and also it's a little bit about bragging rights too. Uh, uh, SEMCOG, the Southeastern Michigan Council of Governments, projects that Sterling Heights will become the third largest city. Uh, right now, Warren is the third largest city. So uh, not that it means much more than bragging rights, but it would be nice to become the third largest. So again, uh, please complete your census. Also, I'm very uh, pleased to um, announce uh, and recognize a few individuals this evening including the Public Works, uh, Macomb County Public Works Commissioner Candace Miller. And she's joined by her team this evening, is going to give an update on a number of drain projects uh, throughout the city and some exciting work that has been going on. And joined by uh, Commissioner Miller this evening, our County Commissioners Rob Myjack and Commissioner Joe Romano as well. So I wanted to recognize them in the audience. Uh, but Mayor, if you allow me, I'd like to call up to the podium Commissioner Miller, who will proceed through her update. Thank you. Absolutely. Commissioner Miller, thank you for being here. And welcome, uh, Brian Baker. Good to see you again. And Commissioners Romano and my Jack, always great to have you. can take my mask off, right, to yes. speak? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mayor and uh, City Manager. I appreciate that. And uh, to all the City Council as well, uh, greetings, good evening. And uh, you've already introduced uh, some of my team, certainly Brian Baker, who's uh, my chief deputy, is uh, not used to being on the other side of this, uh, this uh, <laughs> table here from the city council. And he had a very uh, good career here for a number of years as your finance director. And uh, he's doing just a fantastic job for us uh, as well at the public works office. 
Um, and uh, also recognizing your county commissioners, I think, is, uh, is very uh, appropriate, and I certainly was going to do so as well. Both Joe Romano and Rob J uh, Myjack, uh, even the uh, projects that I'll be discussing a little bit tonight with my team, uh, we wouldn't be doing many of these things without uh, the input and support, uh, certainly, of both of your county commissioners here in Sterling Heights. We've had great support uh, from them on, uh, on, with our budget. Uh, we've had great support with them with uh, different uh, drain boards that they both sit on. And uh, we've got a lot of, we have a lot of activity going on in the Public Works Office, so uh, we have a, a very engaged team. And uh, tonight I'll, I'll also be recognizing uh, two of my team to uh, go through the PowerPoint here with you. Uh, Jeff Bedner, who's our environmental engineer, and also Steve Downing, who's our construction engineer. So uh, we just wanted to give you an update, uh, some of the, uh, a couple of the different uh, issues that we have going on in Sterling here, and some that are uh, nearing completion that we think are very important uh, for both the city council and certainly the residents of uh, Sterling Heights, which I am so honored to represent them all, as well as their public works commissioner. We, uh, we recognize what a large city Sterling Heights is, we recognize what an important community this is. And, uh, you know, part of the um, uh, uh, being a critical component, I think, of economic prosperity is certainly making sure that you have uh, a good infrastructure in place. And so we always talk about our roads, which is very important, of course, always a marquee issue. But we can never forget what's underground as well. And so just because it's out of sight, it doesn't need to be out of mind. And many times, many of our uh, relief drains and different things that we're doing. You drive by them and you think, well, they don't look like much right now, but you get a heavy rain like what we just went through uh, about four or five days ago, suddenly they become very, very important to make sure that we're not having flooding on our roadways, that we're not having flooding in our neighborhoods, uh, et cetera, and that things are operating properly. And so we have been, uh, as you know, in the, in the three, four years that I've been here, done a number of different drain inspections in Sterling Heights, a lot of the uh, underground uh, storm drains that run on your major uh, roadways have been uh, inspected, and uh, we've done some work uh, in some. Some are okay, some are not. You know, we've, we really have a, a very uh, extensive capital improvements program that we've been working through, working through. But tonight we're going to talk about three different things, and I'm going to ask Jeff and Steve to come up here, and then as they go through the presentation, maybe I'll just jump in if I feel like I need to. But uh, We've given you a PowerPoint here tonight. So there's three principal issues, but we also want to leave plenty of uh, room for question and answers and any questions that you have about any of these projects or anything else uh, that we are not addressing uh, tonight that you have a question about or something you see in one of your neighborhoods or uh, somewhere in the city that uh, you've been meaning to ask the Public Works, uh, you know, please do so. We'll, we'll try to uh, make sure we get you an answer if we can't uh, tonight. But, we're going to talk about the Sterling Relief Drain. This is one that you're all uh, pretty familiar with. Most of you have been out there for different uh, uh, activities that we've been having out there uh, as we've been undertaking a major uh, program, a project, I should say, at the Sterling Relief Drain in the last couple of years. This is really uh, almost Macomb County's largest drain, if you will. We have some other ones, but uh, some other very large ones in other parts of the county, but this is certainly one of the largest. It uh, runs, essentially intersects with uh, Macomb and Oakland County, runs between 15 and 16 mile, all the way uh, down to uh, behind Freedom Hill there. So it's a little over five miles, and uh, we've done about a two and a half mile project, uh, all with grant funds. Uh, Jeff will uh, mention to you uh, uh, how much we've spent on it so far, but really it's all been uh, pretty much done with grant funds. So there's been no assessment to uh, the citizens of Sterling Heights uh, or Macomb County, which has been a great thing. Uh, but we've sort of been daylighting it, if you will. Uh, you know, years and years ago, uh, we put in all these uh, uh, culverts, uh, et cetera, uh, everywhere, because that was the thing during the, at that time. Uh, but now we've found that really if we could take out some of these hard culverts and let Mother Nature actually do her thing, uh, it's much better for the environment, taking out all kinds of sedimentation, phosphorus, nitrogen, et cetera, letting the ground absorb uh, much of this. And uh, as well, uh, when we started talking about it with our staff, I said, you know, when we're done with this, we really, it would be great if we could uh, uh, plant uh, some uh, very nice uh, native uh, planting species that are native to the area. And, you know, I also sit on the Detroit Zoo board, and we love our butterfly house in the Detroit Zoo. And I told Ron Kagan, we're going to try to create a butterfly flyway in one of our drains. And, uh, and that really is what is happening there. It's incredible 
what has happened this year. You'll see some uh, pictures of uh, how that has all gone. And uh, so it's important that we think about our pollinators and, uh, and the critters uh, that live here as well. And Sterling Heights is such a beautiful area and having a lot of natural kinds of things as well, I think enhances uh, the area. And of course, we need to make sure it drains. We're in the drain business, but uh, we also want to uh, think about what it needs to look like when we're, when we're complete. Uh, we're going to talk about the Gibson Plumbrook uh, drain. Jeff uh, will be addressing that. Uh, that is something that uh, he's been talking uh, quite a bit with uh, your DPW and, uh, and your city manager, uh, et cetera. And I know uh, Councilman Yanis is very interested in the Plumbrook drain, but this is a, sort of a occlusion of two different drains, if you will, that we've had some issues with. I say we, uh, the residents that are impacted by this drain for decades, I guess. And uh, so we have a sort of a plan uh, to develop an inter-county drain between Oakland County and Macomb County so that Sterling would not have to uh, absorb all of the expense. You're sort of at the receiving end of all of this with the sedimentation. We've heard certainly from some, some of your re residents about that. I think one of them is in the audience tonight that, uh, that joined uh, myself and uh, Commissioner Myjack on a, on a phone call about this. But at any rate, we have some ideas of, of a short-term solution and long-term as well for that. And then we'll also talk about our Hild Hildebrandt pump station. When I came into this office, we found that there were a number of different uh, uh, pump stations uh, all over the county, quite frankly, that, um, you know, needed a lot of work, <laughs> had been neglected for a long time. And Hildebrandt uh, was one of those, unfortunately, and it drains a huge, uh, uh, I think, 330 acres uh, of property there, a big, uh, beautiful residential area and, and commercial as well. And so uh, we, uh, you know, we knew we needed to replace the pumps and we needed to do some work on that. So Steve's going to take you through a PowerPoint and show you how, uh, what we've done, why we needed to do it and what we've done. And we've been working with the city as we're completing this. We're pretty much complete with it uh, to uh, make sure that when we're done, when we leave, you know, I mean, who knows when any of us will revisit that particular site again. Uh, for any kind of uh, extensive work like this. So let's make sure we do it right now. And uh, 20, 30 years from now, when somebody has to go back to it, they think, oh, well, time to, you know, these things do have their useful life expectancy. So at any rate, uh, the Hildebrandt, uh, one thing I, I will say, just talking about how things, they need to work when they need, when we need them to work. Last weekend, literally we had, last week, we had literally just completed, flipped on the pumps, uh, and then came that deluge of rain which was several mm -hmm. inches of rain right in that immediate area. We, we actually posted on our Facebook page, some, uh, some of our guys were out there and gosh, this water is just gushing through the wet well under there like a rapid and uh, it worked, right? So it all worked as, uh, as it needed to. So we, we're just gonna go through these and uh, we don't wanna take too much more of your time this evening, but we'll run through these. And again, if you have any questions, uh, we're here to answer them. So thank you and uh, Sterling Relief. So I think it's Jeff and Steve both up. Good evening, everybody. Um, so the Sterling Relief Drain, I, I thought we would start by just reminding everybody of, of where we started with this drain. <coughs> this drain was constructed in the 1960s. <coughs> And it was uh, conceived as, a, as a, a flow through for the city of Troy, as well as for Sterling Heights, as both communities were, were rapidly developing at that time. It was going to take the flow from uh, the, the northern part of Troy as well as the northern part of uh, Sterling Heights. Um, and and uh, so it was uh, the idea then was really to convey the flow as quickly as we could away from, from the expanding neighborhoods. There was a, a four-foot diameter concrete pipe installed um, to serve as an underdrain system. So every small rain event that would occur would just go into the underdrain pipe and go away, go away from, from the neighborhoods, correct? And then during big floods, we said, well, we need to have a larger channel. So the top part was constructed as a large trapezoidal channel. Uh, and, and this was sized so that it could take all this flow from Troy and from, from Sterling Heights. Now, the construction began, and there were still negotiations going on between both counties as far as what was going to flow through this drain. And, and we got, you know, as far as, as uh, Van Dyke 
and we still had this large trapezoid to carry all of the flow uh, from both communities. So we went from behind Freedom Hill uh, all the way to Van Dyke. And then, then we started to see, oh, Troy's going to do something different. And, and, and Troy developed in a different way. And they built a, a separate interceptor with the Water Resources Commissioner in Oakland County and uh, directed their flows down uh, to Quinder to the Red Run drain uh, right in Warren. So, uh, so that part of Troy no, no longer is planned um, to come through the Sterling Relief. So what we have is a four foot diameter under drain and a very large oversized trapezoidal channel. Now the thinking at the time was to carry the flows away. You know, like, like uh, uh, Commissioner Miller says, we are in the drain business and we are here to drain the land. Well, there's a section of the drain code that, that was oft forgot um, in the 1960s and, and that's a part about water quality, but it's certainly not forgotten by Commissioner Miller. Um, and so we were looking for what ways can we improve water quality? Because when we look at this, what we were doing was taking all of these low flows. So think of all of the, the pollution that would, would occur um, on, on the roads in the area. You know, this, this drain goes um, between, say, 16 mile and 15 mile, a little bit south of 15 mile. It drains almost one third of Sterling Heights. Um, so everything from those neighborhoods, from those industrial corridors, everything comes into this four foot diameter pipe and it just goes out to the Red Run drain into the Clinton River and there is no treatment. We're not allowing Mother Nature to do any work. So we said, well, we can do something better with this. Uh, well, let's see. So what we did was we, we said, let's daylight the drain. Let, let's force water to come up to the surface. Uh, and then we can plant plants that will absorb that water mm -hmm. and also absorb the nutrients um, and, and different things the plants need to grow. Um, that is the, the runoff that's coming um, off of our, our little urban corridor here. We asked uh, for help because this, we knew this would be expensive. So we, we applied for um, money from the EPA and money from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, to support us in converting this drain from uh, a, a traditional, let's just carry the flow away, to a drain that can also uh, have a water quality benefit. And it also has a side benefit of creating habitat. So all total, uh, the EPA and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which by the way, that was the largest award ever in the Sustain Our Great Lakes program for uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, you know, we, so we got 1.8, a little over $1.8 million dollars and we were able to work on about two and a half miles of the drain. And at no cost to Macomb County taxpayers or to any of the residents of, of Sterling Heights. <coughs> so what we did, uh, you know, people think of, of daylighting and they think probably of this picture that's on the, the bottom left, um, where that is. That's the four foot under drain. You can see it as a culvert coming out. And then we've daylighted the drain. We did not do this for two and a half miles. We did this specifically uh, at the very end so that anything that's still coming through the pipe, we have an opportunity to capture and treat. Like let's say we had a, a, a spill. We did have an, an oil spill in this drainage system uh, about two weeks ago, and we were able to, to set booms right in this area. So we were able to capture that flow and minimize any disturbance to the Red Run drain or to the Clinton River. Um, but if you look at the upper right-hand corner and you see this gate structure, that's really how we daylight. What we did was we put restrictor plates in uh, at strategic locations that would slow the flow in the four foot pipe and raise that water level up to the surface so that it daylights into this bioretention cell. And we have a, a, several of these bioretention cells along the two and a half mile corridor. So what you see in the bottom right hand corner is a vegetated bioswale. Now this is all still brand new. The plants are, are, are still establishing. In fact, we just did our first maintenance mow out there where, where we, you know, um, we're, we're encouraging the natives by removing some of the more invasive species before they go to seed. So you'll see that out there, that we'll, we'll do these, these maintenance mows from time to time, but it's, it's, it's actually part of the plan. Now, we planted in three zones. In a, the upper zone, which is that flat area behind the homes along the Sterling Relief, we planted trees. We, we would like to increase the tree canopy there because the trees are really great at absorbing just 
water. So when we get a lighter rain, <clears throat> think of all that water that just collects on the leaves and then slowly comes back down to the ground. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to slow the flow rate uh, and, and, and to just capture uh, water on site. So we've, we've planted, uh, you know, on the order of uh, 250 to 300 trees uh, throughout this, this corridor. These are not small trees. Some of, some of them are, are one inch caliper, so one inch around. But the other ones are, are two inch to two and a half inch uh, caliper. So they're, they're larger trees. Um, and then on the, on the edges, on the side slopes, so where that drain starts to go down towards the bottom, uh, we planted pollinator species. It's a, prairie, a classic prairie mix that's set up for clay type soils and is gonna attract butterflies. Again, um, these species, are, they, they have a deep root system, so they'll be able to, to break up the clays that are in that area and allow more water to infiltrate into the system, as well as support wildlife, um, which we've seen quite a change out there even already. Uh, you know, in this area, sorry, we, we planted about 25,000 plugs, so started plants, and then we also <coughs> will seeded the area. So we, we're seeing these species start to come up now. <coughs> In the bottom of the drain, we, we planted uh, plants that can handle the wet. So in the bioretention <coughs> cells themselves, what we did was we set it up so that we're going to store 18 inches to 2 feet of water after uh, all of the, the larger rain. <coughs> um, and I say larger, I mean like maybe once a month to twice a month, we're going to see water stored in, in, the, in the drain bottom itself. And these are plants that love that kind of condition where they're gonna have water stored in there. Those have super deep root systems. They break up the clay really well. So we're gonna be able to infiltrate that flow. So that means that, that that water is being taken up by the plants or it's recharged back to the ground and not, not just increasing the flashiness of the Red Run drain or of the Clinton River. Uh, sorry, in this area, we planted about 135,000 native plugs. So a whole lot of started plants. The reason we, we went with that kind of, of <coughs> instead of seed there is the frequency with which we get water in there anyway. <laughs> this is my last slide. <laughs> so uh, we, we would be remiss to not show a few of the monarchs that we've seen out on, on the site. Um, like I say, this has been a, a, a great uh, habitat for uh, butterflies. We'll only see that to improve over time. I lied. So we have, um, th this is just saying how much uh, removal of, of different pollution we have that's being taken up by those plants, and it's quite significant. <clears throat> we also have uh, gotten a grant from ITC about, uh, um, to, so that we can water the trees up there. So you see our, our water trailer that we, we got here courtesy of uh, ITC. And, and lastly, we, we have a grant established um, from the, the uh, uh, NIFWIF resiliency grant, $300,000 to work on another phase of this, which will be behind Freedom Hill and, and up to Shaner Road. We've also applied um, for a 319 implementation grant, which is through the state of Michigan for another $500,000. So we're working to, to build the next phase of this project, which will be just downstream of where we completed. So moving on from there to the Gibson Plumbrook. The Gibson Plumbrook drain uh, is, a, is a complex series of a lot of little micro drains, let's say. We have a Plumbrook drain, um, we have a Gibson drain, these are two water bodies. Then we have a bridge that we own that was established as a drain, uh, a Plumbrook bridge, it's Ryan Road. We have two uh, detention ponds that are considered uh, their own individual drains. Uh, it, it's a collection um, of they're, they're all, they were all legal actions by the Drain Commissioner, but it's not one unified plan for how to maintain this area of Sterling Heights. So we've met uh, with uh, the communities of Sterling Heights, City of Troy, and Rochester Hills to talk about ways that we could establish this as one consistent drain so that when we see that there's a need for cleanouts or for inspections or for repair of different items within the system, uh, that's not all just Sterling Heights paying for it. It's the other users of the system, which is uh, Troy and Rochester Hills. These are a few pictures of, of what the, the drain looks like. And if you see, 
you can see a lot of bank erosion. This, this is in the area just between Dequinder and those first ponds. Um, so you can see that, that we've lost a lot of soil along the edges, and this is because it's an urbanized area. The drains are flashy, so they come up really fast, and, they, and, and there's a really fast velocity, like you see in the bottom right-hand corner, that drags the soil away from the sides of, of the drain. And you say, okay, well, so what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal about that is that that soil ends up in, particularly in the first lake. So what we end up with is these sandbars being developed. Mm -hmm. And while this, for, for me as, a, as a, a, an adjunct professor, it does make it very interesting. I see like natural streams forming here. But if I lived on the lake here, I would be a little bit concerned because I thought I had lakefront property, not a science experiment in my backyard. So we are working uh, to establish a fair and equitable way to distribute uh, the costs associated with fixing this problem. Now, I know the city worked on this about 10 years ago, but it's back. These, these pictures are, are just from a few months ago. Now, another structure that we have in that drain is uh, in the northern pond, there's a, a, that's a retention structure and actually a dam. So this is the, the, the dam uh, at the outfall of the structure. It's not like a really large dam, but this does qualify as a dam in Eagle's eyes. Uh, the condition of it looks sound to me, so that, that's good news, but at some point we're going to need to plan for repair and maintenance of that structure. Just downstream of that um, is a picture of a large beaver dam that we had to break in the drain. Uh, and uh, it, that might have been about the largest beaver dam that has been broken in Macomb County, at least in a long time. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Stephen. He can talk about Hildebrandt. All right, so Hildebrandt, um, we were here back in June 2019. We provided an update. Um, a couple of these slides are just repeats from them. The location, Hayes Road, and the East Mile area. We talked to you Sorry about that. We talked at that time in 2019, the location, the existing condition. We had done some investigations of other drains in Sterling Heights and identified a source of some funding. So um, just a quick recap, again, Hildebrand Drain. It services approximately 330 acres. It serves as is both a drain during dry weather and, and for a, a relief sewer during, uh, during rain events. During dry weather, it flows through a 12-inch diameter uh, straight through gravity sewer. And during the rain events, it'll flow into the wet well of the pump station, and it will get pumped up and down, uh, down Hayes Road. So it's definitely a critical piece of infrastructure. Um, back in 2019, we identified the structure as in fair condition. Uh, we went through an analysis with our engineering firm, Spalding to Decker, and we said, okay, what is the cost to renovate the existing structure versus replace it with a new, new structure? Um, and, and with that, the pumps were at the end of the useful life. The electrical system was dated, uh, needed quite a bit of work. And what we found is that the costs were nearly equal. So at that point, we moved forward and we said, okay, let's, let's replace the station. We'll keep the old one online, keep it, keep it moving along, design it, install a new pump station. The new pump station consisted of a new wet well, included new electrical, a new DTE transformer, we were going to uh, bring the station into our SCADA system so we could monitor it remotely to make sure the station was working properly and save time on staff having to run out during rain events or on a weekly basis just to write down the number of hours the pumps have run. We can now see that from, from our computers remotely. Our operators have 24-7 access, which is a nice option to have. <clears throat> it brings it up to speed with the other pump stations uh, within the county. And additionally, we worked on some aesthetic things because, again, we are in the drain business, but we also want to leave and make, make these things look nicer than when we when we started with them. So um, we planted some trees along Hayes Road. Um, you'll see some pictures of those coming up. And we also went with uh, a new decorative style fence. And the, uh, the, the project is on, uh, on schedule to be completed September, uh, so this month. So just real quick, here is the, the site plan showing the old, old pump station with the new layout. We did come in and, and reshape the, the basin a little bit to clear out some of the debris some of the fragmite that was in there that was uh, taking away some of the storage. It shows you the location of the existing pump station versus where the new one is. And on our way out, we'll be putting in a, a nice uh, rock area to have maintenance vehicles be able to pull in and park on a, on a stone area instead of 
parking on the grass and leaving tire marks. Um, I have some pictures here from the construction progress. You'll see we've uh, you know excavated down at this point. We're prepping the subgrade for the new precast wet well structure here. Uh, here's some pictures of them actively uh, hoisting the wet well into the uh, into the excavation. It's pretty muddy back then. Um, and here's some pictures of the new electrical cabinet, new TT, DTE transformer, and uh, and the trees. Um, as Candace had mentioned, we tested this pump station last uh, last week on the 27th. Cut it over. This is the picture here that shows it's cut over into the new station. And uh, like clockwork, the next morning in the early hours, we got a pretty significant rain event. So um, that station tested out. We got some videos of it. It's working great. And we've authorized the contractor to start demo, which they started yesterday. And they're proceeding forward with that. Um, the total project cost was $840,000 funded uh, completely with Sterling Heights drain funds. There was no special assessment required. It was all money that was sitting in drain accounts uh, for the city to use as, as it saw necessary. Uh, as I mentioned, we've, uh, we've already started actually removal of the existing pump station. Um, the decorative fence will come last and we have some site restoration work uh, to do. So uh, overall successful project, new pump station, reliable for the folks in the drain district area. And that, questions and answers, turn it back to Kansas. All right, Council, I'll open it up if anybody has any questions about these projects. Anything? Mrs. Zarco. Mayor Taylor, um, thank you. Um, first, I just have a few comments and then I do have a few questions. But um, the Sterling Relief Drain is probably the one that I'm most familiar with because it's part of my walking route. Um, and I, I, so I can certainly agree with you that it needed some improvements. And I did notice all of the, um, the plants that have been planted and but there, uh, my concern is a little more housekeeping as far as its appearance from the road or from the sidewalk. And that would probably be just maintenance along the fence, edging on the sidewalk, and maybe, maybe six feet in where it's trimmed up. Because I don't think people realize now that, um, that, that there is going to be improvements with the growth of what's been planted there. So right now, it isn't as attractive you know, as it could be. Um, the other thing that I noticed is on the gates that are there, there's hardware on the one side of the gate to make it stationary so that the wind doesn't blow both sections at the same time. There isn't anything that's in the ground that will that hardware can fit into in order to stabilize the one side of the gate. So when it is windy, on one side of the street, it's the gates are concave, and on the other side, they're convex because of, depending on the way the wind's blowing. So it's another thing to consider, but I certainly, it's not a criticism, it's just that if I didn't walk past there at least two times a day and sometimes four times a day, um, I wouldn't be noticing these things, but certainly can appreciate all the hard work that you've done. I even made a phone call to Mr. Romano when all of the old fencing came down and everything was all trimmed out, and I'm thinking, oh, it would be really great if if it could stay like this, but certainly we can't leave an open drain. Um, but I can see that I can see the progress. Let's put it that way. And I'm glad that you explained um, some of what um, is going to happen in the future with all of these improvements. So, um, and that's really all I have to say. So, thank you for putting the time and the money and the efforts into taking care of our drain system. Thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. those comments, and I know my guys have taken note of your uh, constructive uh, input. <laughs> what we need to take a look at. So thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Mayor Taylor. Mr. Schmidt. Thank you. I just have one quick question. So um, I realize now there's more standing water there than there used to be because we're allowing it to drain into the ground instead of out to the lake. Um, my concern, and I've had some calls from residents that have lived in that area about um, the mosquitoes in the standing water. Is there something that we're doing to address more mosquito issues? Well, I think I'm gonna let Jeff answer that question. Go ahead, why don't you? Sure, that, that's a great question, and it, it's one that we considered as well. So when we built these bioretention cells, we put under drains in them so that the water drains out before the mosquitoes can breed. It'll, it'll be drained out in 48 to 72 hours. Mosquitoes don't breed until at least after 72 hours. Okay, all right, thank you. That's all I have. Anyone else? Now I knew when mosquitoes bred, but I forgot that one just temporarily. <laughs> just kidding. 
<laughs> Council, anyone else? Well, uh, Commissioner Miller, we thank you for being here thank and you. appreciate the presentation tonight. Mm -hmm. Very informative and thank you. great to see. Uh, we are, uh, you know, I think the city of Sterling Heights, like you, understands that we have to be functional first, but if we can do it in a way that improves the quality of life and uh -huh. just makes it look better for our residents and the neighborhoods, we're always going to look at that as well. So uh, we're, we're always trying uh, to do things like that and appreciate to have your leadership at the county as well. So thank you very much. We appreciate that information. Thank you, thank you all for here. your time. Appreciate Anytime. it. Thanks. Mr. Vanderpool? Mayor, I have no other items in my report this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda tonight is the consent agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on any item on the consent agenda? If not, Council, we need a motion. Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Koski. Move to approve the consent agenda. Support. It's been moved and supported. With no discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on our agenda tonight is to consider appointments to the Sterling Heights boards and commissions. <clears throat> is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on this item? If not, council, there are three openings or three boards. First is the elected officials compensation commission. This is a mayoral appointment to a partial term ending June 30th, 2022. I would, uh, this board does not meet until January, is it Mr. Kashubsky? That is correct. Um, I would uh, entertain postponement of this item to the first meeting in October. So moved. moved. Support, it's been moved and supported. No discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Next is the Sustainability Commission. One opening City Council appointment to a term ending June 30, 2021. Is there anyone who has an appointment? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Resolve to appoint Nathan Ng, sorry, to the Sustainability Commission to a term ending June 30th, 2021, subject to the appointee meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter Subsection 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion on this item? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm, I support uh, Mr. Inks uh, to join this commission because it was partly his idea that we form the commission. He approached members of city council and said, wouldn't it be wonderful if not only did we talk about solid waste or recycling in the abstract, but we had a commission that would research the best practices. Uh, he's a member of the planning commission, so we had to change the rules or fix the rules to get him appointed, but it was his idea. I think it'll be a wonderful addition and bring his knowledge of planning and also his uh, really deep respect and love for recycling sustainability to the commission. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you, Mr. Radke. Anyone else? No further discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Next is the Youth Advisory Board. Two openings. Uh, the City Council has the power of appointment to terms ending June 30, 2021. There are uh, two individuals requesting appointment, Claire Barsoom and Zion Williams. Is there anyone who'd like to make that motion? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. Resolved to appoint Clara Barsoom and Zion Williams to the Youth Advisory Board to terms ending June 30th, 2021, subject to the appointees meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter 4.03 and taking the oath of office in two, within two weeks. Support. Been moved and supported. Any discussion? No discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. That completes that portion of our agenda. We'll move on to uh, communications from citizens. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on any item not on tonight's agenda? Mr. Jefferson. Ago, we went from 6,000 people down to uh, four people tonight. Um, and this city council is bending over backwards for a group of people who wouldn't show up for fried chicken dinner and a piece of sweet potato pie. Um, <clears throat> and there are lots of events that have taken place over the last few weeks. 
Um, why isn't the police chief here to answer questions? After each one of these events that comes down, he should be here explaining to the city at all costs what he's doing to prevent these events from happening from across the country. <clears throat> that's happening across the country. Make sure they don't happen here in Sterling Heights. Um, another thing, here in Sterling Heights, there was a, uh, about a month, month and a half ago, a lot of people were talking about body cameras. Um, I kind of wish you guys would put that on the back burner. And what I would do is look at purchasing more non-lethal uh, weapons. As we've seen this summer that in two occasions, one in Atlanta and one in Wisconsin, tasers don't work when people get hyped up. <clears throat> um, they just don't work. Um, bullets work, but that's something different. But we need to look into maybe getting pepper spray guns or some other form other than the taser system. Um, another thing is, like I said, I don't know why the police chief ain't there to, to try to answer some of these questions. Um, maybe that's his problem. I don't know. Uh, like I said, we need to get more looking to get more non-lethal weapons. Another thing, uh, this is Mr. Vanderpool, little touchy subject, but that lady, that young lady came down here about a month ago. Um, could you inform the public on her case? Um, were the perpetrators arrested or is it still under investigation? I believe a lot of folks would like to know that answer. And that's it for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Anyone else under communications from citizens? If not, close that portion and go on to reports from city administration. Mr. Vanderpool, anything tonight? Mayor, I can just say quickly <clears throat> in response to uh, Mr. Jefferson's comments. Uh, first, uh, the Sterling Heights Police Department uh, do, does utilize non-lethal weapons and we have in <clears throat> a number of occasions uh, which obviously avoids uh, uh, the, the use of lethal weapons and is advantageous in many situations um, and, and we'll continue to do that. In fact, the City Council just recently approved uh, the purchase of uh, an upgrade of our uh, taser replacement system and we also have other forms of uh, non-lethal weapons. I will say that uh, we also have had uh, uh, numerous uh, protests uh, within and around Sterling Heights uh, over the last few months and I'm proud to say that uh, we did not have any arrests nor did we have any uh, points of conflict or um, any uh, of the problems that are being encountered uh, throughout uh, the country in various areas. And I attribute a lot of that to uh, good police work. Our police department's going through a, an incredibly thorough accreditation process, which requires that every standard operating uh, procedure and guideline be reviewed and, and updated accordingly. And that any and all best practices are uh, identified and, and part of our day-to-day uh, -day operations. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that this trend continues in Sterling Heights. Uh, but I will also say I think part of the reason is that we have a very strong collaboration uh, with community groups um, across the city. Not only our boards and commissions, uh, but our drug-free coalition um, our new African-American coalition uh, for which we've had two meetings now and we've had really outstanding participation and really good dialogue. So I think all of this is helping uh, to uh, ensure that Sterling Heights can continue to be a model for other communities. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. Mr. Kashubski, anything tonight? Thank you, Mayor. Nothing tonight. Council, anything? Any uh, reports or new business? Mayor. Mr. Yanis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, tonight's appearance by uh, Commissioner Miller and her staff was very um, appropriate because uh, um, once again, we have come to the time of year when the Clinton River Watershed Council has its annual river cleanup day. Uh, this year will be September 18th, and Mrs. Miller was absolutely right. I'm very excited to host again this year the cleanup of the Plum Brook Drain. Uh, the cleanup will take place on Saturday, uh, September 18th, uh, from 10 a.m. to noon. And uh, if anybody would like, I would like to first of all invite all my fellow council uh, people to uh, join me if they'd like to. It's it's a uh, hard, dirty work. But uh, it's very rewarding. We pick up a lot of trash uh, through the through the drain itself, and this year we have a very large blockage that uh, I will be calling Mrs. Miller's office to help with the, the removal because uh, I don't think uh, just manpower is going to help. We're going to need some heavy equipment. So uh, again, that's September 18th from uh, 10 a.m. to to noon. Uh, we will have uh, supplies if uh, people have their own waiters and gloves. That'd be great. But we will have some waiters and other equipment, uh, if people don't have the, um, their own equipment uh, to, um, uh, to let people have. And uh, we'll also be uh, providing snacks and water to make sure that everybody's properly uh, hydrated. Um, September 19th, yes, that's, that's right, September 19th, thank you. Uh, Saturday, September 19th from 10 to noon. Um, on another note, I would, oh, and if you need any information, I will be posting on my Facebook page, but please feel free to email me uh, at uh, hianas at sterling-heights.net, and I can give you all the pertinent information, and I'll be posting a, a, a map on where to park and, and so forth. Uh, on another note, I just want to say that uh, last night I had the opportunity to attend the African American Coalition. This was the second meeting, and, and uh, it was just another phenomenal event. I. I never uh, profess to be an expert on uh, equity and equality. I thought I knew what I was talking about a little bit, but I learned I knew very little. And uh, I even posted last night at the end of the meeting, I felt like I should have got college credit for, for, that, uh, for that presentation. It was two hours and it was, it was absolutely fantastic. And I'm so excited to see so many Sterling Heights citizens involved in this uh, in this program and the ideas that are coming out of it and the support is uh, really uplifting. And I, um, I was, it was just an honor for me to be able to be on that, that Zoom meeting. There's so many people involved now, we have to do it on Zoom because we can't fit them all in this room and properly separate them. And the, the police chief did give a presentation at that meeting in regards to everything the, the, uh, uh, the police department uh, is doing to uh, to try to alleviate any of the problems that might that that we're seeing across the country. So, um, having said that, I, I do want to dovetail into this that, you know, I I never said publicly um, that I support the police. I, I for some reason, maybe because of my history working at the fire department, I didn't feel like I had to. I, I called the the I called the union the. Um, Patrol Officers Union, and I asked how the men and women were doing, and and obviously, you know, this was several months ago, and when, you know, things were first starting breaking out, and um, you know, they said, you know, the, the, their their nerves are a little tender, and um, I, I just let them know that if there's anything they needed, they're welcome to, you know, give me a call. I would be happy to go to one of their union meetings and talk to them face to face. I just never felt, I just never thought that I had to stand up or I should stand up publicly at any kind of meeting, whether it's this meeting or another meeting, and say, I support the police. But with everything that's been going on in this country, I want to stand up publicly tonight and say, I support the police. I support Black Lives Matter. I support the issues that are, are causing all the problems in this country. And I appreciate why people are taken to the street. But, men and, but, the, but people have to realize the men and women of not just our police department, but all police departments, all first responders are simply that, they're men and women. They go home at night, or they wanna go home at night. They're just regular people like us, and they have a very stressful job. One of the things, one of the things I brought up when I first got on council, and we were having our, 
that first budget hearing I was involved in, is are we spending money on mental health? Because everybody reaches a breaking point. And we need to make sure that our first responders who go out every single day and do some of the toughest work that people do, physically, mentally, emotionally, we need to make sure that those folks uh, have the proper resources uh, that if they need to take a step back, if they need to take a few days off, if they need to have uh, someone that they can talk to, um, that we have that available to them. And we need to make sure that we're, uh, I, I know the, proper, the, the, the popular phase is to fund the police. Uh, that's not popular here. Maybe we should say refund the police because we need to make sure that they have the ability to do the proper training that they, that they need. And sometimes, and I'm telling you this from my experience with the fire department, sometimes you want to go to training and you can't because they have to fill you with overtime. We don't have the overtime money in the budget. And so sometimes training goes off to the side and it doesn't happen. So I just want to say publicly, I support the men and women of law enforcement. I, am, I, uh, I stand with them when they stand against uh, the things that happen, like what happened with uh, George Floyd in Minnesota and, and uh, officers that go astray. But, you know, it's like airplane crashes, right? You, the news will show you the airplane crash. They don't show you the other 100,000 flights that are going on that, that take off and land safely every day. So I just wanted to say that, Mr. Mayor, I think, and, and I know that everyone on council, I'm not gonna speak for people, but I know that everyone on council uh, supports our police department and law enforcement. We didn't become the safest, one of the safest cities in the country by accident. That was a plan from city administration, through the police department, through the fire department, and down to our citizens with CERT and COPS and all the other programs that we have. So that's all I want to say, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Yan is well said, and I agree. Anyone else? Mr. Mr. Schmidt. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, absolutely well said, Mr. Yanis. Thank you. Um, I too was on the, the Zoom call for the African American Coalition last night, and it's um, phenomenal to see the engagement of the residents in this community that never thought that they could engage with our community and now they're happy to be there and happy to have that voice. And um, I, I consider myself an active listener. I've not really in, you know, interceded and, and given any comments or said anything. I'm there to listen and I'm there to learn. And um, I appreciate all the residents that have come forward and stepped up to, to lead the charge because this is really only the beginning. It's gonna get bigger and better. And uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate them taking time out of their, their evening and, and um, this was our second meeting and, and more to come. So I appreciate that. Um, on another note, uh, through the chair to Mr. Vanderpool. Mr. Vanderpool, tonight we approved um, the repaving uh, of Utica Road from Shaner to Hayes. Can you give me a time frame of when that's gonna be done? Uh, thank you, Councilman Schmidt. I, I don't have the exact time frame, but what I can tell you is it will be done this construction season. Uh, so I know they'll be ramping up in the next few weeks. Uh, Utica Road has to get done yet this year. Uh, 18 mile road. Uh, there's some uh, additional work on Metro Parkway. And of course, uh, the big county road project is Shaner Road. Uh, that still has to start this year. That will not be completed this year, unfortunately. But Utica Road will be completed this construction season, uh, which we anticipate ending somewhere around the December timeframe. And Hope how about Hayes? from Moravian to 14. Uh, same thing with Hayes, that will be done this construction season as well. So the city, uh, we were able to get a really good jump on our road projects, uh, even while we we're working remotely during COVID, all of our neighborhood road projects are, are well underway. Many are completed now. Uh, as you know, um, Sal Road is uh, well under construction, about halfway done. Uh, 19 Mile Road is uh, well under construction. Um, so we were able to get a good jump start. Uh, the county um, uh, is starting their projects now, but they are projects that will be completed this year, with the exception of Shaner. Okay, perfect, thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Mrs. Mr. Mayor. 
throw the chair to Mr. Vanderpool. I've been watching the board and uh, commission meetings lately, the planning commission and the zoning board, and they have had some very challenging, interesting cases lately. And I was wondering if possibly, Mr. Vanderpool, that you could give council a report because I recall that we had said anyone that was appointed to, uh, especially the planning and the zoning board, take uh, classes so that they know exactly what they're doing and how to handle uh, everything. Could you give us a report and let us know what classes they have been given, who has attended them, and what's planned? Even though they may be longtime members on the boards, are they coming back for something like continuing education, changes in the law, and are they given any kind of legal uh, classes where they know how to handle different situations? So if you could do that for us, I would greatly appreciate it in case there's anything that we need to do get, to get them additional training. Be happy to do that. And one last thing, are they given iPads yet? The planning and the zoning so that they can have those so that everybody is the same and is able to make their notes and bring those notes to the meeting. Because I was watching some of them, they would be looking up in one direction and then back to their uh, iPad. So kind of like to know exactly how that's working out if we're able to supply them with city <clears throat> equipment. Okay. Would you like a response now or a follow up? It doesn't make any difference. If you have an answer now, I'll take the answer now, if not later. Uh, Councilman Koski, I can give you just a brief update and then follow up with some more details. Uh, you and I have had some previous discussions on this and and it, it's a little bit of a mixed bag on the Planning Commission and the B ZBA. Our hope is to, in the near future, perhaps with the next budget cycle, be able to get all the um, uh, planning members and ZBA members, uh, iPads, and, and get them fully integrated. Those are the two boards that really need them. Uh, the um, 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 Ordinance Board of Appeals, uh, uh, they have iPads or a sign that, that are there when they come to the meeting. Uh, so, so they're in a little better shape. Uh, some on the Planning Commission and ZBA uh, prefer u utilizing uh, their, their own equipment because it's a little more portable and they may look at their material at work when they may not have their iPad with them and or you know on their on their way um, uh, to the meeting from their office and so on so it it's been a little bit of bit of a challenge to to get to where you and I would like to be with them but we're working on it and i'll get you a little better update on who actually has been assigned iPads and and uh, we've also gone through a, an upgrade of iPads with uh, some of our groups, so we do have an, a little bit of an inventory of uh, used iPads, too, that we can assign on an as-needed basis. But I'll get you more details. And then, of course, my one question was, do the boards receive legal advice oh. from our Yeah, I was going to follow attorney. up with... Uh, a written report to you on that, but I can update issues. you quickly. Um, the BZA, I should say the ZBA, and the Planning Commission uh, do get uh, actual classroom training, if you will, every year uh, through the Macomb County Planning Extension Office. Uh, and, and typically one, two, sometimes three, it just depends on availability and time of the course and so on. Uh, so that's kind of a rotating schedule that we try to get as many members as possible through. In addition to that, uh, the city attorney and his legal team provide regular uh, legal training uh, to both groups, and, and we've done that uh, consistently throughout the years, and even more so more recently. You're right, there's a lot of really complex issues, land use law involving both those boards. Uh, so the more training, the better. And also whether they're able to communicate with each other. Is that something that they do or do they just go in cold on every meeting? 
do they have the opportunity to talk to each other? Well, I do know that the city planner um, and, and the legal liaisons for those meetings come early for the meetings and, and often uh, plans are made available and, and uh, <clears throat> they can have some collaboration before the meeting. Um, you know, should there be questions or clarifications and so on. I know the planning uh, uh, director makes himself a bit available and as I mentioned, the legal liaisons too. So that's the best means of uh, coordination. But they also have uh, periodically workshop sessions uh, where they can uh, again uh, get a preview of what might be on the horizon or again actually get special training too. I was looking at background mainly background on the issues. And because most of their meetings have been Zoom meetings, it's not face-to-face -face contact. That was my concern. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Zarco. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, I want to go back to discussing the African-American Coalition meeting. And I have to say, um, yesterday, again, was the second meeting I attended. And I remember at the first um, meeting when we had an opportunity to introduce myself, one of the one of the things that I mentioned was teach me what you know. Because as Mr. Yannis says, you think you know, but you really don't. And when you start listening, it's amazing what you learn. So. Um, it was, it, I, it's hard to explain because I know that, I don't think we record the meetings, but we have minutes from the meetings. Is that correct through the chair to Mr. Vanderpool? Uh, thank you, Councilman um, Ziarko. We, we, excuse me, we don't have formal minutes uh, per se, but we, you know, we take good notes. And, and the nice thing about Zoom is uh, any comments that come up on the chat session, um, you know, we, we have a history of those. Um, in addition, the PowerPoints, uh, we, we have those saved and we can push those out for follow-up information, but we don't take formal minute, minutes as you would think of it, like city council, something we can do in the future though. Okay, thank you. Um, but I do have to say that the, the um, coalition has become so um, popular that it's probably going to not long before we'll have a waiting list or we'll have a, a rotating people coming in um, to the meetings because it, when you stop and think of the residents that want to uh, be involved, the clergy members that want to be involved, um, the business owners of the, uh, in the, in the um, city that want to be involved, and you, I, it really is a, a great learning experience uh, for anybody that wants to listen. So as we go through these troubled times now and we think we know all the answers, you really don't because something different comes up all the same. But the one thing through all of it that comes up is mental health. And that was, we learned that yesterday, we talk about it um, when you see what's going on across the country, some of that is mental health. And I still remember when our youth advisory board came here a few meetings ago and they did a presentation and they had five goals and they were five um, goals that they were gonna work on and get more information out there to um, their peers and one of them was mental health. And when I stop and think of these young kids can see it and it's, it happens in adults, it doesn't go away. And um, to be focusing on this, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be um, in the city, um, helping one another through this, especially in the last seven or eight months, we all know that, you know, it has been, we're all tested by what we've been going through. So there is a mental health problem, even if you don't have a mental health problem. Um, but uh, truly, I think it was the right timing to do this. And um, I look forward to the next meeting because I know I'm gonna learn something else. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Zirko. Anyone else? I don't have anything tonight. So thank you all for participating. I would at this point entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. We're moved and supported. No discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.